Good morning. Can I remind members of the COVID-related measures that are in place and that face coverings should be worn when moving around the Chamber and across the Holyrood campus? The first item of business is general questions. In order to get in as many people as possible, I'd prefer short and succinct questions and answers to match. And at question number one, I call Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government how the allocations of funding in its budget for 2022-23 will support local services in the West Scotland region. Cabinet Secretary Kate Forbes. Well, the budget for next year delivers record levels of funding to help restore public services across the whole of Scotland, including in the West Scotland region, including uh, record funding for health, uh, record funding to tackle child poverty, and at least £2 billion in infrastructure in initiatives. And the local government finance settlement alone will provide over £1.7 billion for vital day to day services, such as schools and social care, in the local authorities that are either wholly or partly within the West of Scotland region. Neil Bibby. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Year after year, local councils are targeted by the Scottish Government for core funding cuts, and this year is no different despite the council elections in May. The Cosler President has said that both service cuts and council tax rises are probably inevitable. The Minister will know that all 32 council leaders, including SNP leaders, have unanimously condemned the Government's budget as unacceptable. Some even say it is the worst they have ever seen. Are your own council leaders wrong? And is the Minister really saying that every penny has been spent and there is no money, more money anywhere in the budget to prevent service cuts to council and council tax hikes in the west of Scotland and across the country. Cabinet Secretary. Well, SNP council leaders do an exceptional job right across Scotland, but in terms of the overall budget right now, eh, our own budget position is challenging, a 5.2 per cent eh, reduction in next year's budget versus this year's budget for the eh, Scottish budget. And we've been clear that we can't inflation-proof any part of uh, the budget. In terms of uh, local authorities, we have ensured that we protect the core budget in cash terms, but I've already made the caveat about inflation. But on top of that, obviously, providing additional funding for the pressures that local government has themselves identified, not least in social care and education. Question number two, Maggie Chapman. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what measures it is planning to introduce to protect Scotland's communities and ecosystems from land speculation associated with carbon offsetting. Minister Mary McAllen. Thanks, Presiding Officer. Um, mechanisms do already exist to support responsible investment in our land, including the Scottish Land Rights and Responsibilities Statement. Um, but I am very aware of concern about recent purchases and developments, and last year, I asked the Scottish Land Commission to review the rural land market and offer advice to the government on how we ensure that private investment in natural capital, which is needed to help Scotland address the climate and nature crises, is invested in a way which is helpful to our wider political priorities, including empowering and benefiting rural and island communities. Maggie Chapman. Can I thank, uh, thank her for that response? We know that a range of companies and investments are already buying up land in Scotland for use for carbon op offsetting. Brewdog and, and Shell are two examples. Private investment funds and asset managers are generating and selling carbon credits. Even SNIB is putting money into this. Can the Minister outline how much land has currently been bought for such speculation? how much public money has been invested in such approaches, and what we can do within our limited powers to ensure Scotland does not get sold for carbon offsetting greenwash and to protect communities from displacement by green lads. Minister. Um, thanks, Presiding Officer. I would just again begin by stressing that much of um, Maggie Chapman's views here I share. My vision for a net zero Scotland is one in which more people can live and work sustainably on our land. The member is right to highlight the risks that she has, and I can assure her I am alert to them. I'm determined that increased investment in Scotland's natural capital delivers benefits for our local communities in line with those important just transition principles. That's exactly why I have commissioned the work of the Scottish Land Commission, which I await. And it's why we are reviewing the Scottish land rights and responsibility statements to make sure that it is as up to date as possible and addressing these contemporary challenges. And I'll look forward to returning to Parliament to discuss these matters once I have that information in hand. Question number three, Bob Doris. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has any concerns over the use of video doorbells in domestic properties. Minister Ash Regan. Anyone operating domestic CCTV, such as video doorbells, 
must ensure that they comply with the relevant laws and respect their neighbours' privacy. People who believe their privacy and data protection rights are not being upheld should attempt to resolve this with their neighbour, and they have the right to make a complaint to the Information Commissioner if that is not successful. Bob Doris. I thank the, the Minister for that answer. Video doorbells in communal areas of flats often record footage of anyone passing via motion sensors with footage accessed remotely. This can exacerbate neighbour disputes and the impact on vulnerable individuals. That has been my experience. The suggestion from the ICO that those concerned about surveillance can request access to footage held on them and ensure this is deleted when no longer required is just fanciful. Can I ask the Minister to consider how, despite the reserved nature of data protection, we can use existing powers over housing and community safety to work in partnership with housing organisations and Police Scotland to seek to review, regulate or restrict the use of video doorbells for residential flatty properties in Scotland. Minister. I think the member makes a number of valid points there in that question. There are avenues for people to challenge uh, a neighbour's use of a video doorbell. So if they believe that domestic CCTV is being used in a way that is, for instance, antisocial, that it may be harassing or intimidating, then this, of course, may then constitute a criminal matter, and they would um, be able to then contact the police. Um, the Scottish Government recognises that everyone has the right to feel safe in their community, and that is why we are committed to tackling all forms of antisocial behaviour to create an inclusive and respectful society where individual and collective rights are supported and where neighbour disputes are resolved fairly and swiftly. Police Scotland and local authorities lead on these interventions, and we have a range of options available to tackling this type of antisocial behaviour. And we are committed to ensuring that all the agencies have the power and resources that they need. Thank you. Question number four, Siobhan Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to take forward the recommendations in the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission's report on the use of rodent glue traps in Scotland including the recommendation to ban such, such traps. Minister Mary McCallum. Thanks, Presiding Officer, and thank you to Ms Brown for the question. Uh, we are committed to maintaining the very highest welfare standards in Scotland for animals, including wildlife. Um, we have carefully considered the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission's findings, um, alongside all other relevant evidence. And I am pleased to announce in Parliament today that we intend to end the cruel practice of setting glue traps. The Commission's report is clear that there are significant animal welfare issues related to the use of glue traps, not only for rodents, but also for other non-target species such as wild birds. Therefore, we will bring forward legislation to black ban glue traps in this parliamentary term. Siobhan Brown. I thank the Minister for that answer. I welcome this news. Glue traps are one of the cruelest methods of rodent control. Can the Minister confirm that, as well as banning the use of glue traps, will, will we also ban their sale here in Scotland? Minister. Thanks, President Officer. Our intention is to ban uh, both the sale and use of glue traps. However, there are implications arising from the Internal Market Act, which can undermine decisions made by this Parliament, as we know, including in wholly devolved climate and environmental policy areas. We intend to work through these issues to achieve a ban. Question number five, Neil Gray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it and Transport Scotland have had with ScotRail and Network Rail regarding the accessibility of Shots Railway Station. Minister Graham Day. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Transport Scotland has been in dialogue with ScotRail and Network Rail to discuss the feasibility study that Transport Scotland commissioned into improving accessibility at Shorts Station following a meeting with local representatives and the now disbanded Shorts Community Council. Progression of the study unfortunately was delayed due to restrictions imposed by the COVID 19 pandemic. However, analysis of the report is underway and it is anticipated that further discussions will be held with Network Rail in the coming weeks to enable the details to be finalised. Neil Gray. Thank you, President Officer. I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, previous work at Shots Railway Station uh, has seen the installation of a new ramp, but its length 
and gradient, particularly in winter, are less than ideal for people using wheelchairs or with other mobility issues. I have previously contacted Transport Scotland, as the Minister suggested, about this on behalf of constituents, and there was an agreement to conduct that review of accessibility of the station. Uh, and I understand uh, part of the responsibility of this is with Network Rail. However, can the Minister provide an update uh, on that feasibility and whether or not uh, the potential for a lift will be part of that review? Minister. Uh, President Officer, can I commend Neil Gray, but also his predecessor, Alec Neil, for their diligence on this issue and say to him that all options for improving accessibility will be considered, including lifts. Uh, and I've asked my rail officials to keep the member updated as this progresses. Stephanie Callaghan. President officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether it has had any communications with ScotRail regarding the impact of reducing operating hours at Bells Hill train station on the most vulnerable rail users. Minister. Uh, President officer, uh, Ms Callaghan raises an important point. Clearly, technology has changed how people want to access information and tickets, but we also need to acknowledge that there is a place for local staff services on the ground where and when they are needed most. The consultation offers the public the chance to have their say on how to provide an efficient and cost-effective service for the future. And I would encourage people to get involved, including local MSPs, but also particularly groups re representing people with support needs. It is critical that we understand how any proposed changes might affect them. And question number six, Joe Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the action it is taking to address fuel poverty. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. I know the current situation with energy prices will cause many people to worry about the cost of their fuel bills. We share their concerns, and with the limited powers available to us, we are already taking action to address this, including through our £41 million winter support fund. But with powers uh, over energy market reserved to Westminster, we must also see action from the UK Government. I have written to them suggesting a number of measures we believe they should consider, including a VAT cut and targeted support for those on low incomes. Joe Fitzpatrick. Thank the Minister for his answer. The Fuel Well Scheme, introduced by Dundee's SNP administration and supported by Scottish Government funding, provides financial support of between £90 and £150 to help with winter fuel costs for those most in need. Does the Cabinet ex Secretary agree with me that while this action from our SNP colleagues in Dundee is commendable, the UK Government, which has cut £20 a week from universal credit, urgently needs to step up and take responsibility for dealing with spiralling energy costs? Cabinet Secretary. I would absolutely agree, and I commend Dundee City Council for its efforts to help those struggling with their heating costs. It is an excellent example of the kind of schemes local councils across Scotland have established to help vulnerable households with assistance uh, through the Winter Support Fund. Undoubtedly, uh, the UK Government must do far more to protect households from the drastic increase in energy bills being talked about. Uh, reversing the indefensible cut to universal credit would certainly help, uh, but there are many other actions which we want them to take, including uh, curing VAT on energy bills. That would be one of the simplest short-term means of helping energy consumers. We need to see action urgently from the UK Government, uh, because many households are already under severe pressure financially due to increasing energy prices. Willie Rennie. Uh, only a tiny fraction of all the homes in North East Fife have accessed the Scottish Government's home insulation financial support packages, less than 1,000 out of 40,000 homes. As we are in a climate emergency, but also an energy emergency, what is the Government going to do to speed that up and expand it so more people can access this support? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the Member may be uh, aware that we have invested almost a billion pounds in home energy efficiency programmes since 2009, and we have set out our commitment to invest over £1.5 billion to help to decarbonise and to make properties more energy efficient over the coming years. And I have no doubt that the energy-based 
uh, area-based schemes that we are operating in areas such as North East Fife and the member's constituency will continue to benefit his constituents and we want to see that expanded and developed going forward in order to help to meet, should make sure we make properties more energy efficient and also meet our climate change targets. Thank you. Question number seven, Brian Whittle. Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment criteria it will use to determine whether the access to bike scheme represents good value for money. Minister Patrick Harv. Thank you. This is a pilot scheme designed to test whether providing interest-free loans can improve bike ownership and help alleviate transport poverty. The 348 expressions of interest received so far shows that there is demand for such provision. We will assess whether the scheme represents good value for money by the number of bikes purchased by September 2022. Cycling UK will provide a report on its operation after year one. This scheme is in its infancy and we'll judge its effectiveness after the pilot period rather than after a few weeks, as well as continuing to develop the scheme in light of ongoing feedback. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank the Minister for that answer, but I do not think it is unreasonable to ask why a scheme that has access to £390,000 of public funds to offer 500 loans has failed to provide even one three months after it opened. Set against this, I am speaking to the social enterprise Nice Ayrshire Cycle Station, who rescue unwanted bikes, refurbish them and sell them to the public at a fraction of cost new, 650 so far. And I think I would also like to extend an open invitation to the Minister to join me in a visit at some point. The organisation has been hugely popular in the area and encouraged many people to take up cycling, but now they are struggling to obtain funds to grow further. With that in mind, will the Minister commit to making funds equal to or greater than that allocated to his loan scheme to supporting existing successful local initiatives like Cycle Station? Minister. Well, we do support a wide range of organisations, uh, including those which provide cycle repair and refurbishment. I would be happy to explore that issue with the, the member in more detail if he has specific uh, local examples to bear in mind. But I, I do find it a little odd that the Conservatives uh, over the, the winter period were claiming both that we have splurged £400,000 and also that we have not issued a single penny. I congratulate them on the intellectual agility necessary to believe both these false claims simultaneously. Question number eight, Eleanor Whittam. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the designation of UNESCO biosphere reserves in Scotland as areas of significance for sustainable development and climate change. Minister Mary McKellen. Thanks, Presiding Officer, uh, and thanks to the member for the question. There are two biosphere reserves in Scotland, uh, Galloway and Southern Ayrshire and Wester Ross, which together are home to over 100,000 people. Um, both of Scotland's biospheres have received funding from our enterprise agencies, and we support the biosphere approach to community empowerment through the environment, where that is chosen and sustained by a local community. Eleanor Whittam. The Galloway and Southern Ayrshire biosphere, which covers my constituency, has significant support from South of Scotland Enterprise, local government, a range of private businesses, environmental NGOs and community representatives. And that this is a UNESCO biosphere is identified in the local development plans and regional spatial strategies for Ayrshire and Southern Scotland. Does the Minister agree with me that it is a great shame that the UNESCO biospheres appear to have been missed in the draft National Planning Framework 4? And in recognising the importance of the key strategic values that they lead on in terms of sustainability and contributing to the wider social, economic, environmental and tourism aspirations of the area, can the Minister commit to ensuring that UNESCO biospheres um, are truly recognised and are highlighted in the new planning, uh, National Planning Framework 4? Minister. Thank you. Um, yes, in line with the, the members' comments, the Scottish Government agrees that participation can build communities' ability to tackle the challenges and to sustain a healthy, vibrant uh, community. The UNESCO Man in the Biosphere programme is based on that bottom-up, stakeholder-driven initiative. And as such, biospheres are inherently an initiative which must be developed and sustained locally. Um, however, the draft National Planning Framework 4, while it does not specifically name the two biosphere reserves, does clearly set out that local development plans should identify and protect locally, regionally, uh, nationally valued natural assets, landscapes, species, habitats. So, 
And in addition to, to the current parliamentary scrutiny of the draft MPF4, we are considering widely until the end of March, and we welcome comments on our draft to support what I hope will be a finalised MPF4, which will address these issues and we can bring back to Parliament for approval.